Frederick's dream is interrupted by a shrill and harsh sounding alarm clock. Annoyed and still half asleep, he groans and mumbles something. Mmm, campfire. Trying to turn around and hit the snooze button, he quickly runs out of bed to lie on. Consequently, he falls out of his bunk and lands on the metal floor with an audible thunk. A sharp pain can be felt coming from his right elbow. He just hits his funny bone. Ah, what the hell? He cries out, now awake. Confused and in mild pain, he looks around, rubbing his elbow. The room around him is all white metal, with some padding here and there, and a few cargo nets containing duffel bags strewn across the walls. It is illuminated by dozens of small bright lights, and the windowless concave walls arch between ceiling and floor. Ah, right. Now he remembers. This isn't home. He's aboard the Newton. That hurt, he groans, still clutching his right arm. A disembodied female voice speaks up. Good morning, Commander. My senses detected a major impact in your current room. Do you require medical assistance? Frederick contemplates why he always has to be surrounded by those annoying AI assistants, but decides to answer before something could be blown out of proportion. I'm fine, my blanket just fell on the floor. With no emotion, the voice inquires further. Commander, a blanket would not create an impact with such a force. Your statement must be false. Do you require medical assistance? Alright, maybe I was still in the blanket. He pauses for a moment. Yeah, I fell out of bed, alright. Just hit my other, nothing else. Why is he so hesitant to admit it? It's just his MIA. It isn't even capable of judging him for this. Understood. Should you feel abnormal sensations in your little finger or ring finger after the pain has passed, or your hand contract into a claw-like shape, please consult with medical staff, MIA tells him. Already on his feet again, Frederick picks up his blanket. As he reaches up to the bunk, he can see the buckle straps running across the mattress, designed to prevent exactly what just happened. Yeah, I'm an idiot, all right, but there's no way I'd ever use them. I'm not going to strap myself onto my bed. Well, at least he's wide awake now. No point in trying to go back to sleep. He walks over to his storage locker and takes out a fresh jumpsuit with the Helios brand logo on it. After getting dressed and his hygiene taken care of, Frederick exits his relatively compact private chambers, the pain in his elbow now completely gone, thankfully. As the door slowly closes behind him, he finds himself in the main hallway. To his right is the nose of the craft, to his left the aft. As there is currently nothing requiring his immediate attention, he decides to check in on the bridge. On his walk there, he checks by the laboratory. Next to the door is a small display showing different information about the room beyond the door. Frederick interacts with it, navigating a status monitor. Exotic material containment. No anomalies. Good. That settles that. He turns away from the door and resumes his walk to the bridge, during which he contemplates whether or not to bring forward his breakfast break. After a short walk, he arrives at a bulkhead, elevated to roughly chest height. Above it sits a sign. Bridge. After opening the bulkhead and awkwardly half-crawling through it, he takes a seat in the left flight chair. Countless displays show every single bit of information one could need. Fuel levels, oxygen reserves, onboard temperature, the list goes on. At least the projected HUD keeps to the critically important metrics. As he looks out of the cockpit window, he can see the stars slowly spinning around him. After a few moments, the moon comes into his field of view. Well, it spans his whole field of view, to be honest. Shifting his attention back inside, Frederick notices an icon displayed on the flight HUD. Did I receive any messages while I was asleep? MIA speaks up again. Commander, you received a high-priority query 54 minutes ago. According to Protocol 2, you were not disturbed in your sleep until you completed seven hours of rest. Do you wish to listen to the attached briefing now? Gazing back out into the slowly spinning void, he answers, Play it. Affirmative. Two digital beeps play, the second one being higher pitched. A slightly rough, male voice plays. Julian Tachenko from Luna Service 14 here. It seems the convoys of Mayor Frickoris have all gone silent. We need them back online ASAP. Without them, ACS is blind in that whole region. You are the next qualified person able to take care of this, so the other teams are currently occupied. When you are done, report back directly to Robert Miller from ACS. There could be a performance bonus, should the situation be taken care of in a timely manner. The recording ends with another set of beeps. The order reversed. He's dealt with Tachenko a few times by now. Not really the talkative guy, but he's reliable and does good work. Miller, on the other hand, he is a bit special. Professionally, there is nothing wrong with him, but the things he spends his pastime with, one would call him a conspiracy theorist. 
everybody that once worked with him knows that he has an interest in. Let's call them creative stories about the company they work for, world governments and other high profile conspiracies. Frederick still remembers that one time Miller tried to convince him that the paintings in the Helios offices were indeed made by a sentient AI. Like, seriously? A sentient AI? Painting? First off, that would be incredibly dangerous, stupid and extremely illegal. If you have an actual sentient AI at your hands, would you really use it to paint pretty pictures? But there are other, more pressing things he has to think about now. Repairing convoys again. Give me a break. Talk about overqualified. Just what I signed up for, he murmurs. Frederick stretches his right shoulder and speaks up in a commanding tone. Alright, initiate spin halting and reel in the shuttle. I will be leaving in T-10 minutes with standard EVA gear for lunar service operations. Prepare my usual loadout of maintenance equipment for pickup. I guess breakfast will have to wait. Affirmative. Halting spin and reeling in shuttle. The hull of the ship resonates with the sound of a motor humming and a steel cable running across something. With that, Frederick can feel a bit of vertigo kick in and the force pushing him to the ground gets subtly but increasingly weaker with each passing moment. Well, better get going as long as I can still walk. He gets up from his seat and climbs through the open bulkhead, feeling the slight push of the ship decelerating its rotation and his body already feeling a bit lighter. Initially he had a hard time with coordination in low-G environments, but in the past few weeks he adapted to it pretty well. Pressing the bottom of his left elbow, the bulkhead starts closing again, and he makes his way to the aft. Mid-walk he has to switch from walking to bounding through the hallway due to the low gravity. Arriving at the entry to the airlock, he can feel that the spin stop has practically ended, as there is almost no gravity pushing him to the floor anymore. After pressing another identical button, the bulkhead in front of him slides open. He enters the chamber and hovers to the front left of the five EVA suit lockers. Changing your clothes in zero-g is an art in and of itself. The method Frederick devised involves hooking his feet into the bench rails to anchor himself to something. After getting out of his overall, he places it into the locker and takes out the undersuit. It's a padded bodysuit with protectors and various connectors for coolant, power, telemetry, and so on. With a firm tuck, the last glove sets into place, and he can move on to getting into the EVA suit. While they definitely are a huge step forward from the lovely bulky EVA suits utilised in the late 20th slash early 21st century, they are still cumbersome, and reduce the wearer's freedom of movement considerably. There is only so much material science can do against deadly radiation, temperature and pressure. The process takes a few minutes, connecting the undersuit, giving the connectors a once over, slipping into the suit proper, performing a second system check, and checking the oxygen supply. After putting on the helmet and confirming an airtight seal, Frederick pushes himself off the bench and hovers over to the material issue. With his tools already waiting for him in their airtight container, he picks them up and locks the container's straps onto his shoulders with their designed clips. He operates the touchscreen on his left wrist. Check, check, do you read me? Affirmative, MIA answers. Good. Open the airlock. I'm all suited up and ready to go. Opening airlock. Personnel without either equipment, please vacate the area. A heavy duty mechanism activates, and the subtle hum of the ship's system slowly fades away. All he can hear now is his own heartbeat, his breathing, and the slight whirring of the suit's life support systems. I never get used to the near absolute silence. He grabs a handle and propels himself out of the top of the airlock bracing his hands above his head to avoid hitting it against the ceiling. All he can hear when they make contact with something is a muffled thud transmitted through his body. After quickly orienting himself, he finds himself upside down inside the shuttle's airlock. He pushes himself off the ceiling with just one of his hands to rotate his body into the correct orientation and stops the spinning by grabbing a different handle. All right, I'm inside the shuttle. You can lock the front door, he jests. Affirmative. Commander is now ashore. Resetting airlock and entering standby mode. The airlock is plunged into darkness as the primary bulkheads close back up, separating the craft's interiors. With his head mounted flashlight providing the only illumination, the interior feels eerie. By now, this has become routine to him, but he knows well what happens when you get sloppy with procedures. Space travel might have become increasingly safer, but accidents still happen from time to time, and about every single way to die in space is an unpleasant one. Rather take the extra two minutes than suffocate out here, all alone. He manually closes the secondary hatch leading to the main craft, initialising the repressurization. A few dim green lights on his right wrist signify the successful completion of the procedure, though he will keep the helmet on anyways. Better safe than sorry. 
After getting the tools off of him and securing them against the wall, he opens the front one of the two opposite doors leading out of the airlock, this one labelled Cockpit. All of the displays are completely black and devoid of any life. A few sun rays enter the cockpit, cutting through the darkness and highlighting the dust particles floating through the air. There is a stark contrast between bright and dark. The feeling this sight causes is hard to describe. Awe? Fear? The feeling of being all alone, isolated from every single other human by hundreds of thousands of kilometres of unforgiving void is… a unique one. That's probably the reason why MIA exists, now that he thinks about it. Being out in space with nobody to talk to would probably be pretty bad for someone's sanity. I shouldn't have watched all those movies as a kid, he thinks to himself, only half joking, trying to shrug off the sudden existential dread. After sitting down on the left flight chair and struggling with the seat bars for a minute, the mechanism finally locks and he is secured to the seat. Now that he's strapped himself in, he can finally start flicking on some switches. Immediately, some of the screens come to life and the cockpit is bathed in bright light. He activates their navigation and talks into his suit's microphone. Show me the coordinates of the highest priority convoy of Mayor Frigoris. Affirmative. Forwarding corners to shuttle navigation. The orange monochromatic screen to his right suddenly displays a few lines of text, overlaid on a map of the moon. Flicking another switch, he speaks again. ACS, this is FL-37 Newton. Preparing to undock from main craft and enter suborbital trajectory heading towards coordinates 57.3 degrees north, 1.5 degrees east. Requesting clearance for departure. Over. A moment passes until a female voice can be heard through his helmet speakers. FL-37, this is ACS, you are clear for departure. No debris within 50 kilometers of your current position or inside landing vector. Separate from main craft and begin retro burn 90 seconds after a successful separation. Over. Frederick repeats the information he just heard. Repeating, clear for departure, beginning retro burn 90 seconds past separation. Over. Safe travels, FL-37. Over and out. He flicks the switch back off and initiates the main reactor startup. Although these shuttles are capable of jump-starting their reactor with their own internal power supply, it is advised to use the main craft's power instead, leaving the shuttle's reactor running for as long as it takes afterwards, or at least until an external power source can be connected again. Main reactor startup sequence initiated. Utilizing external power source, one. Confirm reactor startup. He presses a button, located in the middle console. There will never be a time this doesn't feel super badass. A sight from makes the craft's hull vibrate for a few seconds before falling silent again. Fusion successfully initiated and stable. Power output nominal. Disconnecting from external power source 1. Alright, undocking from main craft. He pulls a small lever and the whole shuttle rocks with the dull sound of a mechanism unlocking. Immediately, the countless tiny manoeuvre thrusters start firing to separate the small shuttle from the several times larger main craft, the force pulling him out of his seat and pushing his blood into his head. A pretty unpleasant experience. The view of the huge craft above him getting smaller and smaller with every passing moment is a bit scary, triggering some existential dread in Frederick again. Though this should be routine by now, right? But now that he thinks about it a bit, the existential dread never really left. Ever since going to space, it has always been there, at the back of his mind. Finally, the thrusters stop accelerating and fire in the opposite direction to halt the craft, the force pushing him into his seat this time. After those have stopped firing, as well, he speaks up again. Mia, confirm successful UD. Undocking successful. Separation from main craft, 100 meters. Relative velocity, 0.01 meters a second. Good. Now he can finally get on his way. He initiates the retro burn and the shuttle starts turning around. While he sits there and waits, a small countdown in his heart shows him where the main engine will begin the retro burn. Three, two, one. He is pushed back into his seat. Descending down towards his destination, he checks the altimeter. 17.540 meters, all systems are green. Visibility is great due to being on the light side of the moon, and there have been no unforeseen complications involving stray debris. An easy day. Suddenly, the message icon pops up again on his heart. Read it out, he commands, not taking his eyes off the telemetry. Error. The message cannot be processed. Please consult support. What? Are you kidding me? Cannot be processed? This has never happened before. And why is it incapable of reading the message that it clearly identified as one? If you know what it is, you should be able to do something with it, right? He sighs. Alright, just show it on my MFD. I don't care about formatting raw text if it has to be. 
Affirmative. One of the overhead screens flickers for a second and, after coming back to life, shows the typical old school orange text on a black background. What does every man share with every woman, containing that which she, she, she will never have, have? Replaces that which shared with, with what she will never have, and see the, the truth, truth. What in the actual fuck? MIA speaks up again. Commander. Receiving heavily corrupted data stream from a location 250 kilometers northwest of your current position on the map. Attempts at halting the transmission have been unsuccessful. The upload's origin is not marked on any of the known maps. Whatever it is, this is more important than fixing some stupid convoys. Disengage autopilot and switch to CSS, he demands. Affirmative. A small red LED on the dashboard switches to a blue, signifying that Frederick is now in control of the shuttle. Set a waypoint at the upload's origin site. I'm going to take a look at this. Affirmative, if... Did you just imagine things, or was there an audio glitch? Um, status report? All systems nominal? He asks, suspicious and unsure of what is currently going on. Performing system check. System check complete. No irregularities found. Doesn't a system check normally take a few moments? A bit of panic sets in. Are you sure? Affirmative. Well, here goes. He pulls the fly stick to the left and starts heading towards the source of the strange signal. Approaching the coordinates and descending even further down towards the light grey and dusty surface, Frederick hears a bit of static coming from his helmet speakers. He checks the remaining distance. 8.410 miles. Concerned, he takes a look at the multi-function displays. All systems operational, I am receiving some static. Performing secondary system check. A brief pause. System check complete. Life support, operational. Fusion reactor, operational. Main QC and binary computational array, operational. Main engine, operational. Fly-by-wire and stability control system, operational. Deviation detected in long-range communications. Long-range comms, what? Are long-range communications still functional? He asks. Contact with ACS was lost T plus 10 minutes and 25 seconds ago. Contact with ACS, contact with ACS. Wait a minute, of course, the convoys are offline. Keep monitoring essential systems. Should further deviations rise up, notify me immediately. Affirmative. No audio glitches this time, huh? Something is up. I know, I don't know what it is. I hate this. It closes his jaw and keeps on flying towards the coordinates. 1.970 miles in the distance, he can see something. A building of sorts. Looks like a first or second wave outpost, but there are no records of this anywhere. Considering that this is a detour from the predetermined flight path, he'll have to make sure to be as efficient with his fuel as possible. Otherwise, he's going to have to explain in detail to the refueling team why he had to refuel during a mission. And he really doesn't want to get fired over something like this. Turning around the shuttle, he waits for the perfect moment to initialize a hover slam landing. As soon as the small countdown timer of his HUD reaches 0.5 seconds, he jolts the throttle to full power. With incredible force, he is pushed back into his seat, but he is completely focused on the small diagram, functioning like a rear-view camera or parking assist in Earth cars, indicating his distance from the surface. There are fail-safes built into the shuttle's flight control systems, of course, but he still gets nervous every time he does a landing like this. A few tenths of a second off of timing is all it takes to end up as either a lunar pancake or hovering too high above the ground, wasting fuel. Thankfully, his timing was almost perfect. The autopilot takes over as his speed approaches 20 meters a second and gradually throttles the main engine down. With grace, the shuttle rotates to a horizontal orientation and uses its maneuvering thrusters to land vertically, just like a helicopter. Gingerly, it touches down on the ground. Landing complete, MIA informs. Frederick starts undoing his seatbelt and gets up from his flight chair. The weak lunar gravity pulling him to the ground, he walks out of the cockpit and re-enters the airlock. His tall container might be considerably lighter now than it was back in the main craft, but it's still just as bulky. He quickly straps the box to himself again, and with a panel next to the main bulkhead, he initializes the depressurization. The LEDs on his right wrist turn from green to red, signifying an absence of breathable atmosphere. I am leaving. Should I lose contact for more than 30 minutes, send for a rescue team. Affirmative. Commander leaving shuttle. He opens the main bulkhead and climbs down the ladder towards the surface of the moon. A small step for a man, he thinks, feeling like a superhero and giggles a little. This will never get old. 
Stepping onto the surface, he can hear the increasingly loud static coming through his helmet speakers. About 80 meters away from him lies the presumed source of the strange signal. An old lunar surface outpost with no rovers around, no ground personnel about, and an open front door. I've got a bad feeling about this.